Howdy, I'm Guinness Walker, the Criminal Historian, and welcome back to the Game Vault. You may have seen my most recent episode of A Criminal History on The Guy That Drives, Tommy Angelo, and if you haven't, well, go do that. I mean, maybe watch this first, but definitely watch it after. Anyway, for today I'll be taking a look at the game from that episode that somehow passed me by growing up despite being right up my alley, and despite having played most of the other games like it from around that time. That game is, of course, Mafia. Now, Mafia as a franchise is something I was aware of, but I guess the marketing of it was just never big enough for it to really reach me since I went my entire childhood having never played the series until finally picking up Mafia Definitive Edition in early 2022. Now, Mafia DE is a true Definitive Edition, making the Rockstar Games updates to the original Grand Theft Auto trilogy, which share the same label, look even worse than they already did. My understanding is that the PC version, which I played, did have some issues early on that were eventually resolved for the most part, but overall, these two versions, that being the original and the Definitive Edition, are completely different. Functionally, two completely separate games that just have a lot of similarities and the exact same story and map. So my introduction to the Mafia series was with DE, which is one of the prettiest games I've played since Red Dead Redemption 2, at least in its cutscenes, but the Mafia series itself goes way back. I'm talking way back to the humble year of 2002, the same year that GTA Vice City released. Despite sharing a release year, though, these two games couldn't be further from each other in terms of gameplay, at least in terms of their approach to the same genre, that being open-world crime games. Well, Mafia isn't quite an open world, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's do the time warp again and take a look back at the original Mafia on PC in 2023. Now the first thing that stood out to me having played the Definitive Edition first is just how cinematic the original game is, with the Definitive reimagining essentially remaking the opening from 20 years ago almost shot for shot, well, shot for shot but different areas of the city. The original, however, suffers from, well, being a game from 2002, so no matter how hard it tries to be dramatic, it will always basically have static PNGs on all the people's faces trying to act out a Mafia melodrama, which does make it particularly hard to take seriously sometimes when I have a much more updated visual from the remake fresh in my mind. The voice acting also doesn't really help me to take it seriously. Well, let's just say that I hold a high position in a not-so-legal organization. It's just the kind of organization people such as yourself would like to know a lot about. And I, on the other hand, for certain reasons, don't want... Your coffee, sir! Thanks. The whole game gives off a vibe of being from more like 1997 than 2002, and being a lot lower budget than something like Vice City, which, I mean, it was. I spent a considerable amount of time trying to care enough about the original Mafia to actually play through it all the way, but with a much better version just sitting there staring at me in my Steam library, I ultimately decided against it, so the rest of the video will be exclusively on Definitive Edition, the remake by Hangar 13 released in September of 2020. Now the game begins with a pretty epic opening cinematic which shows us various parts of the city we'll be exploring. Lost Heaven, the Mafia universe's take on Chicago. Well, actually, the real Chicago also exists in the Mafia universe, but once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Unlike in the original, though, it is not our character who we follow to the diner, but instead the detective interviewing him. Inside the diner is our protagonist, Thomas Angelo, Tommy, and my god, if there's one thing playing a few chapters of the original game taught me, it's that they absolutely destroyed the original game's performances across the board. Yeah, thanks. Dip your beak. No, thanks. Suit yourself. So, you yeah. said on the phone you might have a proposition for me. That's right. Well, if you're looking to set up a gravy train, you call the wrong cop. I'm not looking for any uh, associates. Good. Because I'm on the nut. Can't even pay for the coffee. The voice acting. Motion capture, directing, everything about the remake is a beautiful, lovingly crafted recreation of the broad ideas laid out by Illusion Softworks back in 2002. We learn that Tommy here is on the run from mobsters he used to work for, specifically his former boss, Don Salieri, and he's meeting the detective here in secret to try and secure a protection deal for his family as he navigates the increasingly hostile waters of mob life. He's willing to sell out Salieri if his family is protected, so we are immediately given a bit of the old Tarantino treatment and teased with the reality that whatever happens, this is where we end up. So the main game is framed as Tommy explaining his life to Detective Norman here, and we'll get a few times throughout where we'll cut back to here before finally catching up to this point at the end of the game. 
For now, though, we gotta go back, all the way back to 1930, when Tommy was just a humble taxi driver working the streets during the Depression, when all of a sudden he's sucked into a life of crime by our next two leads, Polly and Sam. It was at the end of one of those shifts when I first met Polly and Sam. Shit! Tommy is just relaxing, having a smoke break when these two wise guys crash their car near him while in the middle of a protracted gunfight. Sam puts a gun to Tommy's head and forces him to drive away from the scene of the crash and lose our pursuers in the process. Now, this version of the game was likely a lot of people's introduction to the series as a whole, like myself, and for the people who came to this from, say, Grand Theft Auto V, you're in for a bit of a twist. This is most definitely not Grand Theft Auto. The Definitive Edition has had a lot of influence from games like it since it was made with many years of hindsight, but it is ultimately still a remake of the Czech game from 2002 that itself had very little gameplay relation to something like GTA, beyond being a criminal in a big fictional city. Mafia is a lot more like a simulation game than any GTA ever has been, and the driving controls are a lot closer to something like GTA 4 than 5, but they're even more punishing than 4's with an emphasis on vehicle weight, using the handbrake correctly, even having to switch to manual or automatic transmission if you want. The original game was notorious for being brutally difficult, but the Definitive Edition does have the classic difficulty mode, which is what I'll be playing on, which does its best to replicate the better parts of that difficulty, while updating the game's controls and mechanics to more closely resemble something like a Grand Theft Auto. I will also be playing without a minimap or aim assist, since I'm using a controller, but I don't recommend this if you just want to experience the story and have fun. This game, even if it can't hold a candle to the originals, is still really difficult at times. Our first mission is simple in concept, but can go wrong really quickly and in a variety of ways. All I gotta do is drive my cab away from the guys chasing us, and that's easy enough, but once you cross the Rudy Giuliani Bridge, three more cars start chasing me and I have to find a special location along the road where road work is being done to trigger these scripted cutscenes that eliminate each pursuer. I'm pretty sure you can just lose them if you're a good enough driver here, but it's not particularly easy since, again, this ain't GTA, and driving fast and furious in a 1930s cab is not exactly easy. When we finally do lose all the guys chasing us, all we gotta do is drop off Polly and Sam at Salieri's bar, where Sam then gives me a big fat check for all my trouble, emphasizing the need to keep what happened between us, and offering us a job should we ever need it, though Tommy is initially very reluctant. Well, Salieri gives Tommy a lot more money than is necessary to repair the cab, and it gets Tommy thinking pretty quickly that maybe working for them wouldn't be so bad, but for now, it's back to driving miserable people around the city to make a few bucks with our next chapter slash mission, Running Man. So it's time to learn to drive, or rather, get used to driving in Lost Heaven. I have to deliver a few fares to their destinations, first a bitter old racist to her church, and then the 1930s equivalent to a Bitcoin bro to the museum. And then the fun one, a drunk guy, but a polite drunk guy. If I don't tell the cops about the liquor on your breath, you don't tell them when I break the limit. Good deal. Great deal. Got any good fares today? Yeah, some. But never enough of them. Who's got the money for cab rides since the market tanked and it all went to shit, I guess. Only reason I got you taking me places is I am drunk and don't know better. Cops see enough drunk fellas. They're only after the people moving it and selling it. Yeah, but I've seen them go after guys for less. Guess so. If they think they can shake something out of you, they will use. Any excuse. <clears throat> this city's corrupt as all hell. Sure is. Also, I'm not sure how I would check this, but I feel like this guy is voiced by the same guy who voices Polly. Maybe it's just me. Once I drop him off, he tells us about a coffee shop around the corner, so Tommy decides to take a break. Whoa, Jesus, tap dancing Christ, my Dunkachino. So now it's a race to Salieri's with these two punks chasing us. 
Now, I might throw up the footage if I still have it, and I should, but I definitely had a lot more trouble with this when first learning how to play this game, but this time around, it's a real simple run through the alley. Vault over some obstacles and take care not to slow down, and before you know it, you're back at the bar triggering the next cutscene. With his cab once again smashed to hell thanks to the guys going after Salieri, Tommy asks the Don for permission to go after them and return the favor, with a little bit of help from Sam and Polly. So that means it's right onto our next mission, slash chapter, with Molotov Party. Hell yeah, that does sound like a party. Molotov parties are the best parties because Molotov parties don't stop. So we get to meet Vincenzo, the crew's weapon expert who gives us a baseball bat and the eponymous Molotovs, and then Ralphie, the mechanic for Salieri's crew, who reminds me of Steve Buscemi for some reason. One day I'm gonna cut your brake line, asshole. Then we gotta drive over to Morello's bar in North Park with Polly and smash up some of his cars, which I want to point out was Tommy's idea. Nobody forced or even pressured him into doing this. Salieri was prepared to just pay him again for the cab and be done with it. So the game introduces us here to the ability to crouch and perform stealth kills, and then we get our first real fight when a couple of goons come outside. Then we just gotta toss some Molotovs on the cars and steal the car of the guy who attacked us, Dino, and then drive back to Salieri's, losing the police in the process. Now, I'm glossing over the details here because this particular run was smooth, but these missions can go so wrong, so fast. Losing the cops here can be simple enough, as it was for me, or you can end up driving onto the sidewalk, running over pedestrians, and bringing the weight of the entire police force down on your ass. So again, this isn't Grand Theft Auto. You gotta think more like it's real life, if that makes sense, and try to only take calculated risks, since the checkpoints aren't always generous, and dying means going back. No exceptions. Once we get back, though, we're in. Tommy gets initiated, so to speak, into the family as a soldier, I assume, and I guess this is also him being made? And we're given our first actual mission as a mafioso, and our last mission for the 1930 chapter of the game, Ordinary Routine. Hey boss, it's done. No trouble? Yeah, nothing we couldn't handle, Mr. Salieri. Good, good, sit down. You see Morello? Nah, but he'll be plenty pissed when his boys tell him what happened. <laughs> He's not going to be able to think straight for weeks. See, that's the difference between me and Morello. I'm a businessman. I do everything with this. Every decision I make, it's what's good for the business and my boys. But Morello is a hothead. And all that anger burns out the brain. And when he gets mad, he gets stupid. You got nothing like that to worry about with Tommy here. He was aces the whole way, boss. I'm glad to hear it. I got a growing business here. We could use a guy like you to help out around the bar. Maybe run some errands. Make sure the bills get paid on time. You up for that? Oh, it'd be an honor, sir. Good. Good. Now, Polly and Sam have already vouched for you. But you need to understand we have a few rules around here, so you listen and listen good. First, no cursing on the premises. There's a million words out there. And the man who needs to resort to fuck this and fuck that is just ignorant or lazy. Second, we don't deal in the hard stuff. I don't want any dope fiends in this neighborhood. We'll let Morella poison his own people if that's what he wants. Finally, stay out of trouble with the cops. We only have a few on the payroll. And if you cross the line, the rest will come after you. You understand? Yes, Mr. Salieri. Then I'm gonna only ask you for one more thing, Tommy. I don't keep Paulie and Sam around just because they're strong. A lot of guys out there bigger and tougher than these two. And I don't keep Frank on apparel because he's smart. Though he is an artist with the numbers. All these guys in this room they're here because they have the only thing that matters to me. The only thing that should matter to any of us. You know what that is, Tommy? They're loyal. That's right. Now, you stay straight with me, you're gonna be living the high life, Tom. But you abuse my trust, Don Salieri, you won't ever need to worry about me. Okay, then. Welcome to the family. Excellent. Now I'm starving. Luigi! 
Let's see. Welcome. A barman Luigi is not much of a cook. But his daughter Sarah, Maron. And so now we are actually in the Mafia. And our first real job as a mafioso is to go on the usual collection run with Sam and Polly, getting money from the various businesses that Salieri protects from Morello. Now a lot of this game is driving. A lot, but that is not by any means a bad thing. This is the first time we'll have some nice long drives and really get a feel for the City of Lost Heaven, which, more than just being a take on Chicago, is its own thing, and Hangar 13's reimagining of Illusion Softworks' original vision is an absolute joy to cruise through. We have a few stops to make along the way though, first off making a collection from a bakery where I have to personally go and collect the envelope of money from the poor baker's mother, who curses at me in Italian. I can also take a look here at a note on the counter which tells us that the bank is also about to foreclose on their home and bakery, probably thanks in large part to what I'm doing right now. Our second stop is someplace in Chinatown where Polly gets to demonstrate his anger problems and racism. Well, Sam demonstrates that too, but then it's off to our final collection at Clark's Motel way out in the sticks. Now, I didn't have enough patience to see if the original Mafia had a world map this big, but I'm pretty sure it did, and I mean, damn. Now, granted, it isn't as impressive in the Definitive Edition, given that it came out in 2020 when much larger games with more detailed worlds have existed, but the sheer scope of the original game's world puts something like Vice City to shame. At least, I assume so. If Vice City even touches this map in terms of size, I guarantee you that's only because if you count the 80% of the world map, that's water, anyways. So we drive all the way out to Clark's, and Sam and Polly head inside to collect while Tommy demonstrates how much of a rebel he is by smoking in a no-smoking area. But then, holy shit, Polly's been shot and Sam's been kidnapped all in the space of like 30 seconds, and now all of a sudden it's on me to sneak inside and rescue him and get Salieri's money. Jeez. This is our first mission with stealth, and I mean, I've never been one for stealth mechanics. I do give it a try here and manage to do well, but then... Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, god damn it. I didn't even mean to. Okay, you know what? It's fine. All you were going to die anyway. I actually do really well here because I know I remember dying an absurd number of times in this fight, but once you get the hang of the controls, it's really not that hard of a game. Foreshadowing. What the hell was that? Uh, anyway, moving on. Sam. Oh, they really went to work on you, buddy. <laughs> Christ. Uh, come on. You'd be alright. You're tough as nails. Once all the goons are dead, we find Sam and then get jumped by the guy with the money who runs off and tries to escape by car. So naturally, the last leg of the mission involves hopping in our car and chasing the son of a bitch to get the money back. Something neat about driving in this game is that it gives you infinite ammo for your weapons for some reason. I mean, I can guess the reason, because with the ammo caps on most weapons, you wouldn't be able to destroy one car, let alone the several you're expected to destroy in this mission alone, with just your pistol. I mean, the only other option would have been to just make the guns super overpowered when in vehicles, or just not have shooting at all, but I don't know, I guess this works. Actually, I think you could make this even harder by removing auto-aim when in vehicles, but that, along with automatic transmission, are my one, uh, two crutches. I almost end up being run off the road by the third car that comes after me, after making the car with the money crash, but thankfully, once they get out of their car, they completely lose interest in me, I suppose, allowing me to casually run to the money car and complete the chapter. Before we continue, though, we get our first intermezzo, or interlude, which cuts to the scene from the game's introduction. Remember, this is all supposed to be Tommy recounting specific stories to Detective Norman. It's here that we get to see Morello for the first time, as far as I remember, and he is, like pretty much everybody in this game, another fantastic performance, and this scene really helps to build him up as a presence and a man to be wary of. So next I decided to jump into free ride mode. Now, my biggest gripe with Mafia is how free ride mode is handled. It is a lot of fun to explore the City of Lost Heaven, but you are rarely given the opportunity to when playing the main story. And the only way to do so outside of missions is free ride mode. The annoying thing is that you are never given a good opportunity to exit from the story and enter into free ride mode, or better yet, you aren't allowed to select your story missions from, say, Salieri's Bar while in free ride mode. 
It sucks because there are an additional 12, I think, missions that you can do in Free Ride, which are unlocked as you progress the main story. Not to mention collectibles and secret cars to find, but I just really wish that the game could have used this as its base and allowed you to start missions like in a GTA-type game from Salieri's Bar, wherever is appropriate. Anyway, speaking of those extra missions you can do that I mentioned... Now, I don't know what you have to do to erase your progress in free ride mode because I deleted my save for this playthrough and yet the notes unlocked by completing story missions as well as my progress completing the first three was still saved. Regardless, I wanted to at least try each of them again and thankfully you don't actually need to complete each of them to take a stab at each one, which is really good because, dear god in heaven, these missions are among the hardest challenges I've ever attempted solo in a video game, ever. Period. Now, maybe that just shows how bad I am at video games, but believe me, these missions are no joke. They aren't usually complicated, but when done on classic difficulty, they are absolutely brutal, and I don't even want to imagine how hard these must have been back in 2002 if they existed, because even with modern controls and mechanics, these are still ridiculously hard. I had completed three of them, the Crazy Horse, Betty, and Electric Trick Track, but I still to this day, after trying probably over a hundred times, have not completed Pennies from Hell, and I don't know if I ever will. I decided that during each year of the story, I would spend one session in freeride doing whatever I wanted, since this isn't a 100% run. And this time, I spent a bunch of time trying to redo the crazy horse, and trying in vain at Pennies in Hell for the 1,000th time. Oh, I failed at Crazy Horse, too. <laughs> These missions are completely doable on easier difficulty modes, even hard, but classic mode just gives you absolutely no room for failure. You have to be perfect, or you just won't get it done. The mission Pennies from Hell, for example, goes from a 9 minute timer on Easy to a 6 minute timer on Classic, and you have no idea how much those 3 minutes can make a difference. Anyway, I refuse to torture myself and try to actually beat all of these on Classic, but I will at least attempt them all, probably, and do a bit of exploring each chapter, but for now let's move on to 1932. Now our next chapter is, well, shall we say controversial, or perhaps a better choice of words would be complete and utter bullshit. You see, back on PC in 2002, this mission was obscenely hard. So hard that it single-handedly gated probably more than 50% of the people who played it from being able to proceed, because what the game was asking of you had such an intense high skill floor, and not to mention mouse and keyboard controls in a driving game. So when Hangar 13 ported the game to modern systems, among their many changes, was a difficulty setting, as I've mentioned before. Playing through this mission on easy, medium, or even hard, even with the driving set to simulation and not normal, is just overall not that bad. This mission, and more specifically the race in the middle, is entirely beatable now, depending on what difficulty you settle on, and what driving setting you use. It's still a challenge for sure, but not ridiculous. Doing the race on classic, on the other hand... Now, I have had to do this race many times now. The first time when recording the footage for the original airing of the Tommy Angelo criminal history more than a year ago, then a second time when replaying it on my own time, and a third time when completing it on stream, and now a fourth time for this playthrough. The first time I played it, it probably took me like 17 goddamn tries, no joke. It is absolutely brutal, and leaves practically no room for error, and even this doesn't come close to the challenge the original game presented, so I'm told. And while I didn't get that far myself, having played it myself, I don't doubt this to be true. This mission revolves around a local racer that Salieri backs named Mikey Dunn, who is now in danger of being shown up by some European hotshot who's new into town with a faster car. So, we are tasked with first getting to the racetrack, thanks to Ralphie having a friend who works there, and then driving the European's car to a mechanic who will sabotage it for the race. So the first real challenge here is then getting the race car to Lucas in the narrow time frame, and then driving it back to the autodrome while it sputters and misbehaves before the next guy starts his shift, since, well, he's an ass. I just barely managed to make it, but I do indeed make it, and then we are launched right into one of the most anxiety-inducing challenges any modern game has ever thrown at me. I'm just going to let you guys watch this first attempt at a race with minimal commentary, keeping in mind that I have done this race several times in the past, but this is my first attempt at it in many months. From Europe, we got the hotshot favorite, Martin Lichtenberg, taking some time out of the International Series to compete with us today. Got some news from the grid here. Lost Heaven local favorite Mikey Dunn is out. Replacing him is uh, Tommy Angelo. Well, I'm sure you'll all join me in wishing him good luck. They're lined up on the grid. They're ready to start. The pack rolls away, but there are some worried faces from the mechanics in the pit lane. 
Lichtenberg's in trouble. There's something up with his car. Lichtenberg in. Ah, oh, shit!
amount of tension when I screwed up that first turn on the third lap was crazy. Honestly, this was the absolute perfect way to experience this mission. Having done it many times before, and the threat of having to spend possibly hours on completing it again looming over my head, the pressure was on. This is a great example of practice makes perfect too, because I remember feeling for a long time like this race was actually just impossible on Classic. I knew it wasn't, not literally, but it certainly felt like it, and now, child's play. I'm really proud of this. I want to take this run and hang it up on my wall. We close up the mission by palling around with Salieri's crew outside the racetrack and have to find Polly, drunk as a fish, and take him home, though he insists quite loudly that we instead need to take him to a brothel. Take me to the ladies! Take me to the blue tropics! Speaking of ladies, at the end of Fair Play, we finally get a tease for the romantic subplot between Tommy and the daughter of Luigi, the bartender at Salieri's, Sarah. Sarah is adorable and very sweet, but doesn't like to ask for help from the likes of the mafioso who surround her. Luigi, on the other hand, is a good father and, like any good parent, worries for his child's safety, even in her adulthood, given the company that he and his friends keep. Luigi asks Tommy to walk Sarah home to avoid some Morello goons who have been giving her a hard time, and Tommy gladly obliges, given that he already had a bit of a crush on her. Uh, Tommy's, uh, Tom's gonna take you. That right. Hey, I just work here. Make sure nobody bother you. Fine. If it'll make you feel better, Pop. Hey. I'll see you tomorrow. Let me get my coat. I'll wait for you outside. This whole mission is very short, and it's mostly just a walking simulator. We walk with Sarah to her apartment and get to hear them have a real conversation one-on-one, -on -one, and when we get there, the thugs that Luigi was worried about are right on cue. I guess they all live around here, or all plan to be here waiting for her, which is disturbing to think about, but either way, we're here, which means they've got a new problem. So melee combat in this game is kind of a joke. Just mash two buttons, in my case circle and triangle, or as far as the game is concerned, B and Y, to dodge everyone who comes at you and then whack them in the face until a big B shows up and BAM! You can put them down in an animation that quite frequently just doesn't work correctly. Alright, you alright Sarah? They didn't hurt you, did they? Jesus Christ on a pogo stick! So the bruiser here is a bit harder, but like, I only mean a bit. All you gotta do with him is dodge every time he comes at you, rather than only the first time, and then eventually he goes down like everybody else. Then Sarah takes us upstairs to patch us up, and we get to hear about her backstory, and how she first learned first aid patching up her father from her abusive mother's attacks. This chapter is really light on the gameplay, but it serves its purpose well, and is the picture-perfect definition of short but sweet. You got an extra blanket or something? No. And it heats out. Myself, though. But if you think a guy like Tommy or Salieri, for that matter, is going to let what they tried to do slide, well, you haven't been paying very much attention. When Salieri hears about what happened, he is furious, as are Sam, Polly, and Frank, and presumably Luigi, but he ain't high enough rank to be in here. The Don orders us to make it right by beating them all within an inch of their lives, and I mean, I kind of thought I'd already done that, but quite clearly it was not enough, and to be fair, if there's anybody I have no problem hurting more, it's those bozos. So we head over to a contact in Chinatown, Big Biff, who, rather than taking us back to the future, directs us to Morello's boy's hangout, where Polly and I arrived armed with baseball bats signed by Babe Ruth himself. Tell me a nicest ass I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yo. Oh, Billy, it's the guy from the other night. We gotta go. So our first leg of this mission is a chase and shootout in this warehouse area. First we gotta fight a bunch of those bruisers again, this time most of them are armed, and then we gotta chase down the main two guys who start shooting at us, giving us permission to shoot back, not that we really needed it. This is another fight which can be quite difficult if you don't make use of the very conveniently placed video game explosive barrels, but eventually there's nowhere left to run and the two goofs jump into their car, forcing us to give chase. This is actually probably the hardest part of the mission. Don't lose them as you drive this relatively hard to control car in the rain. I don't have to follow them all that far though, thankfully, as eventually they crash their car, and Tommy is given the chance to put them out of their misery, but hesitates. Polly, on the other hand, does not. Fucking die, man. Christ, Tom. I needed a bit of a break after that though, and allowed me to just quickly continue my earlier stated gripe with the free ride system. 
So at the end of my last session playing, I wanted to stop, jump into free ride, and then jump back into the game. However, I skipped the cutscene at the beginning of Fair Play since I wanted to stop playing the night before at the end of the Ordinary Routine mission. So when I started playing Fair Play using the Continue option on the main menu, it puts me in the game right after the first cutscene, meaning that to see it, I had to go back and use the Chapter Replay option. The problem is that the game considers the Continue option your main game, and using Chapter Replay doesn't reset your progress, meaning after I beat Fair Play, Sarah, and Better Get Used To It using the replay, the game still considered me on Fair Play in my main playthrough, and thus wouldn't let me into the Autodrome to race and freeride, so that's bullshit. I actually think the best way to play this game is after having beat it once by using the chapter replay, allowing you to jump into freeride in between chapters and actually explore the world of Lost Heaven since, especially in comparison to the original game from 2002 with its PNG building textures, is just begging to be explored. It honestly frustrates me how much more work went into making this world and how little of it actually gets used since this is a normal 15 or so hour experience. Maybe double that if you consider replays in freeride mode, but the world is one that you'd expect to find in a 60 plus hour RPG. So anyway, I jumped back into freeride and got tantalizingly close to finally completing Pennies from Hell, but still no dice. And I don't even think I can show any of you the secret cars, since as far as I can tell at Bertoni's Motors, I've already done them all, I think. Back to the main story for now, I suppose. So now we come to the final mission in the 1932 chapter, and a big one. The Saint and the Sinner, which as far as I can tell was originally two separate chapters titled The Priest and the Whore, so good job on renaming the new mission. Nailed it! <clears throat> to a cross. Uh, moving on to the actual mission, we have quite a mess to deal with thanks to our actions in the last mission, though. As it turns out, one of the guys we killed, well, Polly killed, was actually the son of a city councilman, Roberto Galati. And as Salieri puts it, You want to drive a politician into Morella's arms? There's no better way than killing off his family. And as it also, also turns out, the other guy somehow miraculously survived and will be attending a funeral for the guy that we did kill at St. Michael's Church. While all of this is being dumped on us, Salieri also mentions that a nearby brothel, the Corleone Hotel, nice, is making deals with Morello despite being a loyal front for the Salieri family for a long time. So Sam is going to deal with the guy who survived at the church, and Tommy is tasked with going to the brothel and silencing a woman who Sam saw regularly, whom the Don now suspects has been feeding information to Morello's men, Michelle. Oh, and then after that we have to blow the place up. What? Morello wants to take businesses away from us? He'll inherit craters. So yeah, this mission is quite a doozy, and the first really big mission the game throws at us in terms of consequences and what's asked of Tommy. Tommy now has to kill an innocent woman for having a big mouth if she even said anything at all, and it instantly weighs on both his and Sam's consciousness before accepting the consequences of the life they've chosen. Almost. Outside, before we get going, Sam asks us to save Michelle, the girl whose life he put in the crosshairs, and convince her to leave town instead, giving her $100 to do so. But anyway, Tommy agrees and we're going to drop off Sam at the church, and then make our way to the Corleone. So we make our way inside, and we have some freedom here as to when and how we initiate the conflict. When we enter, the hotel's manager is having a meeting in the lounge with Morello's men, celebrating the change of management, and I always opt to simply walk right in, introduce myself, and... You must be the manager. Don Salieri sends his regards. I love that Tommy says the line here, too. Then we get a seriously difficult shootout, or it certainly can be, and a long one at that. We start in, well, I started in this room with the manager, which instantly puts me up against two guys, one of which always has a shotgun. But even though our goal is to get up to Michelle's room on the second floor, in a first-time playthrough, you can also have a look around to actually find out what room she's in. But, it's also a good idea to come around back here for ammo and extra health if you're hurting, which I usually am. So eventually, I make my way up the stairs as slowly as I can and reach Michelle in room 208, where Tommy, well, just watch this scene. It's some fantastic acting. <laughs> You, Michelle? What's it to you? A fella named Sam is one of your regulars. Maybe there's a lot of guys named Sam. You know him. Works for Don Celieri. Maybe you got him talking about our business from time to time, and maybe Don Morello offered you some money to spill what you heard. No, Sam, trust me. I, I don't say nothing. He knows that. But Don's losing a lot of money because someone <laughs> can't keep their mouth shut. I was just bumping guns with some of Morello's girls. I didn't mean nothing by it. Tell him I'm sorry. Tell him that I will never open my mouth again. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You're scared then. Good. Don't you ever forget how it feels to be this scared. To know you're just one twitch away from a hole in the ground. 
because if you ever show your face in this town again, they're going to find you with two in the head. Do you understand? Lucky for you, Sam's got a big heart. Get dressed and make tracks. This place is going to blow soon. Thank you. Just don't come back and we're square. With that, Michelle seems sufficiently convinced she needs to leave and never return, so our next goal is to make our way to the manager's office and plant a bomb, which is easier said than done. On Classic, especially with a controller, you gotta be slow and deliberate with your shots, otherwise you end up in really bad situations like this. See, this asshole over here is coming for me, but I can't move much because of his buddy at the other end who has a machine gun, and this is not Call of Duty, which means bullets hurt and- OW! Eventually, though, I do make my way to the manager's office, but before that, I, uh, um, find this guy. Actually, this is a reference to Mafia 3 with one of the game's bosses. Um, this one. I'm too lazy to look up his name while scripting this. But in the office after planting the bomb, Tommy realizes he has a problem. He's already set the timer, and he now needs to get the hell out and fast. Well, a good jump shouldn't be too hard to ma- <laughs> Ow! Again. Okay, we're almost done. I think I just gotta keep moving before we- Oh, Jesus! The next section is this rooftop battle with a bunch of cops. Some at close range, and some trying to pick you off with rifles. And again, with how low my health pretty much always is, it only takes one shot from most rifles or guns, for that matter, to kill me. But thankfully, I can heal up to like 15 or 20% by hiding. It really helps to have a long-range weapon here, like the rifle, and you can get one from this guy, but if you're not careful, the guy on the roof opposite can and will kill you. Finally, we make it to the end of the rooftop section and cross over into the church, where we descend some scaffolding and peek in to see how Sam handled his end of the job. Oh, Jesus, Sam, what the hell? What are you doing? Wait. Fuck, I said that out loud. That's the guy who killed Billy! <laughs> okay, and now we have another massive shootout inside the church, where I am immediately placed in a less than ideal situation. Molotovs are being tossed, there's a guy with higher ground firing a Tommy gun, it's just chaos, but remember, slow and deliberate. Bam. I actually have been doing really well in this playthrough so far with the magic of hindsight having played it twice in the last year or so. Trust me, these fights are a lot harder than they look if you're not fantastic at shooters, at least on classic they are. So then we get cornered by the guy we just killed, somehow, and then Sam steps in and actually finishes the job, which I am supposed to be thankful for, I guess? Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for doing the one thing you were asked to do, but way too late and only after I had to kill like a dozen other people. Good job, Sam. Now comes what is often the hardest part of the mission, for me anyway, escaping the cops. We have to blitz it outside to the hearse because I have learned that staying and fighting is always a bad idea, but you can usually drive away fast enough and then you just gotta be smart about your driving. Tommy is the guy that drives after all, so after only one horribly failed attempt, I get it done. Lose the cops and bring Sam back to Salieri's for a job well done. Holy crap, that was a long mission. And next, we have another intermezzo, where Tommy tells the story of when Frank told him he could one day replace Don Salieri. This cutscene sets up a very important mission coming up, but more importantly, gives additional screen time to Frank Coletti here, who has otherwise really only been seen next to the Don. You could run this town someday. Well, I appreciate that, Frank. When we cut back to 1933 now, we get another massive mission though, and honestly, from here, they pretty much all will be. Saint and Sinner marks a turning point where the game starts to gradually ramp up to a boiling point, and it is quite effective, I must say, just like any of the great Mafia movies which it is so heavily inspired by. This mission, a trip to the country, sees us helping to ensure the safe delivery of a massive shipment of Canadian whiskey coming from my neck of the woods. I especially love this mission because anything that mentions the prohibition smuggling of Canadian whiskey has direct ties to my home city of Windsor, Ontario, where a lot of the whiskey that guys like Al Capone got back in the 1920s and 30s, with Salieri being heavily inspired by Capone among others and Lost Heaven being a take on Chicago primarily. Anyways. So we have to drive out to Salieri's factory and meet Polly, who will then drive us out to the country where we are meant to meet Sam. We had a nice long cutscene of just Tommy and Polly discussing their lives, and it's a good one setting up a lot of the aforementioned tension and building on their character arcs. Polly alludes to how lonely he is, how he is envious but happy for his friend, and expresses some of his doubts in Sam, while Tommy increasingly shows apprehension and even nervousness towards the increasingly violent and horrible things he's expected to do, even if on some level, he enjoys it. 
So we finally reach the farm, and big surprise, Sam isn't answering when we honk our horn, and it's quiet. Too quiet. So we gotta go investigate while Polly goes off to get the rest of our men ready, just in case something is afoot. And I mean, come on. There'd definitely be a feat around here. Use your head, Polly. We can investigate as much as we want, but things only kick off when we reach a certain point along the linear path. With the first indication that something is truly wrong being when we find a dead dog. Kind of dog. Eventually, Tommy comes across the Canadian, and pretty soon it's another brief but intense shootout. Once we've killed them all, Polly and the rest of our guys show up, but soon we learn they were actually cops in Morello's pocket. And more to Polly's concerns, we still haven't even found Sam. Well, I continue making my way through the farm and get into a few more skirmishes. First this one in this barn, where the boys take care of pretty much everything for me, and then this ambush here in another barn that I've already seen several times and was more than prepared for. Then we get to the next big firefight, and we find Sam holding his ground in another barn, but before we can reach him, he's hit, sending Tommy and Polly into high gear. This fight through the field can be a real bitch, as the baddies here are quite aggressive with their molotovs, and it's really dark, especially if you're playing at night like I usually do, so finding your targets can be tricky. Once I remember that I can just cut around them, though, I start to make short work of them while they're distracted fighting Polly and the others, and then we can finally move into the barn to check on Sam. As we find Sam still barely alive, though, yet more baddies arrive, and Polly runs off yet again to get the truck so we can transport Sam to a mob doctor. So while Polly does that, we now have to play defense from up here while making sure nobody makes it all the way up the ladder or the stairs to our side and kills Sam. Or, you know, Tommy. This is one of the harder parts of the mission for me every time, and I always die here at least once. It also goes on for quite a while, which makes making strategic use of the ammo box here and the Molotovs very important. I guess I've never explained it, but the way ammo boxes work is that you can get a full refill for all your weapons from any one of them, but only once. So you have to choose when to use them, and only when you're basically out of ammo, or when otherwise absolutely necessary. After the second wave of cops shows up, Polly finally arrives with the truck, and we can get him inside, putting us into the next and final, sort of, section of the mission, the on-rails shooter. Yay. Now, once again, this section didn't go nearly that badly for me compared to how it has been in the past, but that's because I knew how and what to do based on the many, many times that I failed at it in the past. But make no mistake, I did still die. A few times, actually. You have to shoot at multiple cars approaching from multiple directions without dying yourself or allowing the truck you're in to take too much damage. And it can be quite a lot to balance on classic difficulty. We get stuck at one point and have to hold out for a while while Polly tries to get the truck unstuck. And then after that, we end up in a one-on-one -on -one shootout with a freaking armored car they have, which I don't even know how a police force in 1933 even got one of those, but whatever. We gotta shoot out the turret and then shoot out the windows and throw a Molotov through the windshield to finally get rid of it, and whew, we're finally done. We drop Sam off at the mob doctor, and then all that's left is to drive home with the rain coming down and the radio setting the mood. But there is one more cutscene before we end the night, and it's another good one. Have a watch. You're late. Dinner's cold. Work. But now it's time for the mission that was first foreshadowed in the last intermezzo, Omerta. We start with Tommy meeting Don Salieri in the park, who reveals that there is a rat in the family. And to Tommy's shock, it's Frank Coletti. Salieri tells the end of a story that Frank first brought up in the intermezzo, where Salieri tried to drown Frank's dog when it lost the first race it did back in Sicily. 
Frank broke the Don's nose over it, and apparently after that he shot it. Knowing just how serious the literal bookkeeper betraying the family is, Salieri is sending Tommy, who has increasingly proven to be the family's best shot, to find Frank and do what needs to be done. We see Vinny, who gives us a Lupara, which is apparently sort of a ritualistic mob tool for killing rats, and then we're off to find Frank by following a short trail, first to Big Biff's, and then Little Tony, heh, <laughs> on Central Island. Finally, we find Frank under the protection of the feds at a safe house in Oakwood, and then we have to follow him to his destination, wherever that might be. While all of this is going on, the radio is scripted to play a baseball game between the Lost Heaven Lancers and the Empire Bay Cannons, which is thoroughly entertaining, and along with a lot of what you do here on the radio, really goes a long way in keeping you in that 1930s vibe, something the original Mafia certainly didn't do nearly as well. This piece of unique scripted radio is also a perfect way to make what is otherwise the most annoying type of mission in these kind of games, the tailing mission, a lot more bearable. Would have been even better if we didn't have to do it at all, but meh. As the Lancers defeat the cannons, ending a 30-year rivalry between the two, we arrive at the airport. And we are now given the mission's real objective, to reach Frank at his plane's hangar, by whatever means necessary. Now this mission, and you'll be hearing me say this a lot more as we go on, is a giant pain in the ass. Or at least it certainly has been for me in the past. However, there is a very easy and almost cheaty way of completing it. So there are basically three options for getting through the airport. Go quiet, go loud, or the third cheaty option, which I'll get to. Going loud, though, on classic difficulty anyways, is absolutely brutal. Going quiet is a lot more viable, but if you're dumb, like me, you'll very quickly end up having to be loud anyways. I ended up dying again here, but upon failing, remembered that third cheaty way which I mentioned. You can just walk all the way around the complex, just pass through this building by waiting for the scripted guards, and then go behind the hangars and around the side, and bam. Incidentally, this also makes the most sense to me, since one untrained cabbie shooting through dozens of federal police officers is less believable than him just sneaking by all of them. At least to me. What Tommy says to Frank in the cutscene, though, implies that going loud is the cannon route, so to speak. So Tommy, being a family man, is convinced by the presence of Frank's wife and daughter to let him go, despite the immense danger to himself and his own family in doing so. This is the second strike. As Frank leaves, we cut to his funeral, where Don Morello attends, along with the first appearance of his underboss and little brother, Sergio Morello, and the whole thing is intercut with Tommy personally burning Frank's house to the ground, ending a chapter for their family, and giving Tommy one more reason to worry. You're making my boys twitchy, Marku. Sergio, when I just came by to pay respects, that's all. Known Frank a long time. Almost as long as you. He's a good man. Smart. Loyal. <laughs> Loyal to his wife. His kid above all else. There must be some kind of honor in that in you. Maybe. But I'm still looking at this headstone with his little girl's name on it. It's a hell of a thing. And next we have one of the more annoying, less important, and overall meh chapters of the game in visiting rich people. Now, the story does still connect to what we've been doing, but as far as I can tell, there is nothing in this chapter that needed to be included except for maybe showing Tommy's increasing paranoia when dealing with the Don. We gotta break into a prosecutor's mansion and steal whatever evidence he supposedly has on the Salieri family in relation to the murder of Bobby Galati, the city councilor's son. In order to get that evidence, though, we need to bust open a safe, and Tommy has a lot of things, but Safecracker is not one of them. So we first meet with a fresh-off-the-boat friend of Salieri's, here to help specifically with this job, Salvatore, who only speaks fragments of English, although he seems to understand it completely. Tommy, on the other hand, seems to know less Italian than I do, and so there's a comedy of miscommunication between them throughout the mission. We drive over to the mansion, climb over the conveniently broken part of the outer gate, and we are met with... a maze. Now, unlike other missions, this is not a loud or quiet situation. If we alert the guards, we have to restart the section, so it becomes a matter of locating and eliminating all the guards silently, and without a minimap, playing at night, it can be tricky to spot everybody in time. Eventually, though, I kill the last guard, and then... Wait, where the hell did Salvatore go? I hear 
And it sounds like he's over here. What the hell? Now he's over there? Okay, this guy is just throwing his voice to screw with me for not speaking Italian. I get it. So we enter the mansion and we clumsily learn that the safe will be behind a painting, and we are allowed to wander inside, trying not to be seen by staff, and checking all the paintings we find. I do know where the actual safe is, but I took my time to just admire this unique set piece while I was here and- Who are you? Ma'am! Ma'am! Someone help us! <coughs> We're not here to- <coughs> 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 Uh, that was in character, right? Uh, moving on. So once we find it, Tommy jumps the gun and triggers the alarm by reaching his arm right inside. So now we are put into an action section of the mission, but luckily for me, Salvatore is not in danger of being killed here. So it's just a case of being slow and deliberate as usual to take care of the half a dozen dudes or so who show up to try and kill us. Once I take care of them all, we can just hop into a car and make our getaway. Now if you get spotted by the cops on your way out, you'll have a chase, but in my experience, that rarely happens in this mission. You can usually just lose them by following the dirt road behind you, and by the time you're back in the city, you should be good. Then, to finish the mission, all we gotta do is drop Salvatore off. Simple. Not terribly interesting, but not criminally boring either. A very middle-of-the-road kind of mission. Before finishing the 1933 chapter of the game, though, I decided to give my arch-rival mission a try one more time. Pennies from Hell. Well, it was a few more times. Now, I can't actually communicate to you how insanely frustrating this mission on Classic Difficulty is, but know that before this playthrough, I probably tried this mission more than 30 times. I kid you not. Now, for your viewing pleasure, enjoy this montage of me failing this mission just during this playthrough. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. And this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things Diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the Diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. But then, finally, after learning the ins and outs of the mission, and more importantly, finally coming armed with a bolt-action rifle, I do it. And the reward is... uh... gold shotgun? I think? That's pretty cool, but honestly, I'm really starting to question why I'm putting myself through these free-ride missions on Classic. They are... absolutely brutal. Alright, on to another story mission, and this time one that is much more engaging and relevant than the last. After the fiasco with the Canadian, the Salieri family was left with no inroad to the illegal booze business, and eventually, Polly sniffs out a new opportunity to replace him with somebody from down south. Being a Polly plan, it isn't exactly big on details and contingencies, but once he gives Salieri, Sam, and Tommy the full pitch, it's time to head out to Central Island together for a very action-heavy encounter. Spoilers. As we arrive at the garage, everything goes normal. We meet the southerner, a guy named Gates, and Polly breaks his nose, again, to make the deal look authentic, since it's meant to look like he's betraying Morello due to a lack of protection. But then, right as we're ready to leave, Morello's goons show up. Or, sorry, Morello's gorillas. Now we have to fight down the car park alongside Polly and Sam, and this can get pretty intense. Once again, though, this is a mission that gave me way more trouble in the past than it did during this particular playthrough, which, I mean, kind of sucks, because it means less for me to talk about. You can clear the first floor pretty normally, and then the second one gets lit on fire by some zany antics, and we're forced to use the back hallways, where I almost get killed by this fella. The thing that's most annoying about this mission really only applies if you're going for a deathless run, and I mean, if you're going for a deathless classic run... Good luck. The thing is that the truck Sam is driving, with all the booze we came for, can take damage during the drive down the floors. Once we reach the bottom and transition to driving it back to Salieri's warehouse, the truck retains its health bar, leading to... 
this. Gotcha. Luckily, when I reload the checkpoint, the truck gets a full health bar again, otherwise this mission would be 10 times more difficult. Anyways, we get the truck back after avoiding both the goons chasing us and the cops, and boom. One more down. One more chapter, actually, and now it's time for the end to Act 2, or the beginning of Act 3, I guess. Right after one more intermezzo. Well, not quite yet. First, it's time for some more freeride antics, and not pennies from hell this time, thank god. No, instead, I'm gonna try one that I'm pretty sure I did before because... I don't know, I'm a masochist, I guess. Moderate Velocity. The goal of this one is to first catch a runaway bus and then be Keanu Reeves by keeping the bus above 30 miles per hour for like 6 minutes straight, which is a lot easier said than done. Eventually, I gave up trying to beat it again, if I ever even beat it the first time, and then tried another one that I actually hadn't done before, Betty. In this one, you have to drive a car across town. That's it. The catch is that it guzzles gasoline like nobody's business. Oh yeah, did I mention that? This game actually has cars that use gas. It's something I remember happening at least once during my first playthrough, probably in Freeride, but still. You can just be driving around and actually run out of gas, but there are luckily gas stations dotted around the map that you can use to refuel. It never comes up during normal gameplay in the story, and only during Freeride antics or Freeride missions like this one, but yeah, it's a thing. I remember thinking I was actually crazy the first time this happened to me and my car just stopped working. I almost bought a new controller thinking mine was busted, but nope. I was just out of gas. I tried this one many, many, many times, but had no success. I even tried turning the difficulty down briefly, but changed my mind pretty quickly. If I'm going to torture myself doing these, I want to at least be able to say I did them on Classic, you know? Okay, on to some more story with a big one, or I guess more so an important one. Bon appetit. Carlo, Don Salieri's normal driver and a guy who's related to the Don by marriage, has called in sick today. And so the guy that drives has instead been given the task of driving old Enyo around town. He asks us if we're carrying a gun though, and Tommy seems surprised, which I mean, given that they're mobsters with the kind of clout they have, I don't see why they would ever not have a gun on them, but what do I know? Now, something I want to bring up here is the game's speed limiter. Maybe I've complained about this in one of my GTA videos, maybe not, but sometimes I like to really take my time doing missions in games like this, especially when things aren't narratively urgent. However, be it because one minute is actually an hour in game time or because they're just impatient, NPCs always rush you to complete missions in these games quickly. Drive quickly even when it makes no sense narratively, but whatever, I mean Grand Theft Auto is one thing. In Mafia though, the game goes out of its way to encourage you to drive like a sane human being, you know? Otherwise act normal except for when carrying out mob errands like, say, assassinations. But if you drive the speed limit and actually go out of your way to be quote-unquote normal, eventually NPCs will still yell at you for taking too long because they long ago ran out of scripted dialogue. I'm pretty sure both times I've done this mission, Salieri has said the line, I like to eat early, Tom. This ain't early. In fact, it's getting kind of late. And I'm like, dude, would you like me to speed to lunch? Anyways, rant over. We get to the restaurant and sit down to a nice meal until learning that apparently Tommy is a booze hound, which we've never really seen much of up until now, and also apparently he'd recently stopped drinking because Sarah threatened to leave him if he didn't. And Salieri is the one that put her up to it. So all of that is fine, and some of it does come up later, or was lightly hinted at, but it feels like there needed to be at least one scene somewhere of Tommy acting a fool because he overdrinks, or just getting really plastered in general. As it stands, these lines feel like they just come out of nowhere, and just as quickly vanish because the only relevant part of the interaction is the power that Salieri exerts over Tommy, and how Tommy reacts to learning about it. Halfway through the meal, we are interrupted by more gorillas. Tommy spots them and at the last moment manages to get himself and Salieri to safety, but now we have to circle around and ambush the attackers while Salieri supposedly distracts them with a shotgun he conveniently finds under the bar. This really shouldn't be difficult, but I die like twice because, I don't know, I'm terrible at video games. Once I clear the, like, four dudes in the back room and come around front, though, all that's left is taking out four more, and we can rush inside to check on Salieri, who somehow, miraculously, survives, despite having killed exactly zero of them. Well, Salieri immediately figures out who is responsible, Carlo, who just so happened to call in sick today, so our next destination is his house for Salieri to execute some mob justice. Get it? We get there, and Salieri tries to handle Carlo himself, but being an old, rather large man, gets tired pretty quickly, giving Carlo an opportunity to run, and us an opportunity to chase him. Then it's like the reverse of that scene when Tommy first joins Salieri's crew, getting chased by Dino and Lou, only this time, we catch up with them before they get away, and put a bullet in his back. He's still breathing, though, and... Oh, boy. Never mind. 
We also get one more scene where we finally get to hear Sergio Morello speak, and get to see our first real scene with Morello where he says more than a couple lines. I really like Sergio's portrayal, and I feel like he's criminally underutilized in this game. He doesn't have a presence at all in the early game, and really only is visible in this scene, the funeral, and his own mission which is coming up, but yeah, Sergio rules. Lucky bastard. That's why I'm here. Salieri's still alive. God damn it! What happened? I don't know yet. Crew we sent is dead. Restaurants all shot to hell. Stop your cry. Can't have a conversation here. What about uh, the cockroach Carlo? Found him with his head smashed in like a fucking watermelon. Never seen anything like it. <laughs> so the Ari must have figured Carlo was the rat. God damn it. <laughs> Even here myself, dang. It's gonna be a war. I told you to <laughs> shut the fuck up! <laughs> We've been at war since we killed Papone. It's just out in the open now. What do you want me to do? Make your rounds. Tell little boys to keep their eyes peeled and their powder dry. Okay. Put the word out. Hey. Just uh, keep your head down, little brother. You too, Don Morello. Before we get to the lucky bastard, though, we gotta take out somebody who's been a thorn in our side for some time now. City Councilor Roberto Galati, father of that kid Tommy killed earlier, and the mission better get used to it. He's going to host a big birthday party for himself aboard a big boat, how humble, the Lost Heaven Queen, and he also plans to announce his new plan to step up the fight against the mob at his party, giving us the perfect chance to silence him very loudly. The family has a janitor on the take who works the boat, so he's going to take a pistol and leave it in the bathroom, Godfather style, for us to grab, and then all we got to do is wait for the right moment. Well, first we got to get on the boat. To do that, we, uh, I don't actually think a plan is thought out, or at least explained to us beforehand, but what actually happens is Polly and Sam knock out one of the other janitors, I guess, or just regular boat crew, and give Tommy his uniform. This seems really last minute, and like it has a lot of problems, but whatever. When we actually get to the boat, the guy mentions us being the new guy, so I guess they found out there was a new employee and then knocked him out because otherwise this is the most convenient method of sneaking inside they could have possibly asked for. Once on the boat, Tommy spends presumably like an hour or whatever just cleaning up and somehow not arousing anybody's suspicion, but once we're given control, all we gotta do is make our way to the bathroom and get the pistol. There is this one guy who bugs me as I make my way to the back, but a quick fight gets him out of the way and just to be safe I toss his body into the water wheel. Once we get the pistol, we just gotta make our way to the top deck and wait for Galati to finish his speech. And then, once the fireworks start, well, the fireworks start, and we are presented with a truly frustrating encounter. The fireworks going off behind us make it really hard to see who we're shooting at, and you can also take damage from them if you stay too close too long, so this top deck fight can be a thoroughly annoying one. So, during this playthrough I decided, fuck this mission. I mean, I know fair play is the one that everyone hates, but with how good it went for me during this playthrough, nah, fuck this mission. I died so many times in such frustrating ways during this mission. The tight, narrow corridors of the boat, the lack of first aid kits, the confusing layout, just fuck this one. I don't like it. Eventually, though, I manage to take out everybody and make my way to the side of the boat where, unfortunately, the final cutscene doesn't retain Tommy's magnificent outfit. Oh yeah, I figured out what the reward for the mission pennies from hell was. It was this. Alright, we're gearing up now. Time to take out Morello's brother and underboss, Sergio. We see a cutscene showing Vinny and Sam chasing after Sergio, but yet again, he manages to survive by the seat of his pants. So since Tommy has proven such a competent assassin before, he's next sent to clean up their mess by planting a car bomb under Sergio's car. When we actually get there, his place is being guarded by literally one dude who apparently isn't suspicious of a fellow trench coat wearing mafioso hanging around. All I gotta do is walk through this alley and then hop the fence and plant the bomb. There really isn't much to say here. I guess if you're even worse than I am, maybe you could alert the guard or something, but this is another scene, and this game has many, that feels like it didn't actually need to be a gameplay segment based on what we got, or should have been a lot more complicated or just engaging, because as it stands, too often is this game just a good movie. A really good movie, but still, a movie. You know, it's kind of like that one Martin Scorsese movie- <laughs> uh. 
Yeah, so, uh, that wasn't Sergio. That was his wife. But apparently, Sam and Polly have located Sergio while all of this is going on, which begs the question, if they didn't know his schedule, why the fuck did they plan it the way they did? Anyways, we are then told to go and meet Polly and Sam across town in a cafe where they've tracked Sergio down, but Tommy is still traumatized by what he just did. We drive across town, which is literally around the corner, I guess, and arrive at a cafe where Sergio and his boys are having lunch. Polly and Sam hand Tommy a Tommy gun, but as they confront Sergio, they go to shoot through the waitress Sergio tries to use as a human shield, prompting the still-distraught Tommy to intervene and give Sergio another chance to get away. Then we get to our first shootout of the mission, and a much simpler one than what's to come. Here, it's just like four guys in the main room, and then one or two in the back, and then once they're dealt with, we get another cutscene where Sergio just barely escapes again, and it looks like the whole mission was yet another failure. <laughs> And next, we have to chase down Sergio and not lose him or get shot to death while following him on a bike, but with these more realistic driving controls, that can be a lot easier said than done. Noticing any trends? At one point, Polly and Sam will try to catch up and assist, but they crash their car two seconds later, so I guess it's up to the man named after a gun. Wait. After a long, protracted chase across town, we end up at the docks in the work quarters and are presented with another long and protracted encounter, and honestly one of the game's more frustrating ones. Maybe it's because I only had a pistol and rather ineffective shotgun at the start, or maybe it's the terrible crosshair and my shitty controller, but I always struggle with this fight for far longer than it's ever fun. In fact, it seems to be this checkpoint right here that always gives me the most trouble. I ended up actually quitting in frustration the first time around, since it was the end of the session for the night and also like 2am, but even though I didn't have to, I ended up replaying the whole mission from start to finish when I realized how few first aid stations were at the docks. This time though, I would be more careful. Oop, that's two games too soon. Also, I discovered during my second time through that there is somebody else who can apparently catch you when planting the bomb on Sergio's car. This guy, but also apparently melee is completely silent. Anyway, this time I took my time, at least tried to, but I gotta complain about something else. There are several spots in this mission and in the next with snipers up on these cranes or sometimes water towers. First off, when you kill these bastards, they don't actually drop their rifles, which is frankly bullshit, but secondly, they make it possible for you to climb up to these platforms, but since the cover deteriorates and there aren't any rifles to have, you just end up at a death trap, which, to be fair, I already knew about and yet still did this time, so this specific one is on me. But, point stands. Finally, I clear out the yard by using the one first aid kit that I could find and some molotovs in this interior, and then I just gotta flip the switch to send a tanker car crashing into the building completely unnecessarily, which allows us to continue chasing Sergio. Then the last section is this fight around the train cars inside, at the end of which you gotta be real careful not to let Sergio's stray bullet hit you. But as long as you hit him at least once, he stumbles off into the back, triggering the final cutscene. You just winged me, asshole! You think you're the guy who's gonna kill me? <laughs> what did I tell you? No one can touch me. You ain't that lucky, bastard. Wait. No! All right, this is it. Time to take down Morello once and for all. With the war between Salieri and Morello at a fever pitch, Morello goes into hiding after the death of Sergio, but as Tommy states, a boss has to be seen as well as heard, so eventually, he's forced to make a more public appearance. And as soon as he does, the Salieri crew is on it instantly. Morello is going to host some charity gala or some such shit, with some of the city's creme de la creme, hence the title of the mission. So that's when we'll hit him to send a message that now, Salieri is in charge. You fuck with him, you die. 
Now we finally get another opportunity in this mission to choose our loadout before going out, which is frustratingly rare outside of free ride mode. So I like to grab a magnum and a bolt action rifle, but unfortunately finding ammo for it on the battlefield will be very rare. So first we drive over to Central Island and catch Morello on the way out. Polly and Sam don't manage to just gun him down right there and then though, obviously, and we are forced to give chase. This chase can be pretty annoying, but one thing to remember is that it isn't actually possible to catch and kill Morello here, like Sam and Polly keep saying. The only thing you gotta do is not lose him and not die, so that's what I focus on. The cops and baddies do seem scripted to show up at certain times, but unlike something like, say, GTA V, they aren't so heavily scripted that they can't be thrown off their normal course. Eventually, Morello leads us to the airport, and funnily enough, Polly comments on how they only just finished fixing the place after Tommy's rampage in 33. Once we reach the airport, though, the mission switches to on foot, but thankfully, unlike a lot of other gunfights in this game, we have both Polly and Sam here to back us up, and they will actually get kills, and are themselves invulnerable, which on classic difficulty is a huge help. Can we go after him on foot? Come on! I ended up dying in this first section, though, to one of those snipers I mentioned, but I also realized that during that run I'd lost way too much health from crashes and gunfire during the chase. So I did the whole thing one more time to give myself a better starting point for the firefight. This fight isn't super long, but it is pretty tricky. If I didn't have Sam and Polly here, it would be downright BS, but as it stands, it feels appropriately difficult as the lead-up to finally killing Morello. In this mission, there are guys who actually carry bolt-action rifles too, allowing me to get some additional ammo, even if it isn't much. The final section sees us fight a bunch of really annoying placed enemies in the hangar who... What? Who even... Where? Where? But once they're finally dealt with, we push through to the other side of the hangar and transition to the mission's final section. Well, sort of. We jump into a car, but for once, don't drive, and have to shoot down Morello's plane before it gets the chance to take off. Once we damage it enough, though, Tommy does take over driving... Cause I'm the guy that drives! And now we are in the final section where we just have to chase down Morello's plane and not lose him. The whole time I'm driving as fast as I can because, duh, and I keep getting the cops on me, causing Sam and Polly to interrupt their dialogue and yell at me for it, which I don't remember ever happening in this mission before, but it was particularly annoying this time. When Morello's plane finally crashes, we catch up to him and Tommy personally puts him down, but as Polly said, he was already dead, he just didn't know it yet. He knows it now. Yeah, pal. I'll do it. Come on. Let's make tracks. And so ends another chapter, and with it, we get one last intermezzo with Detective Norman finally having learned it was Tommy that killed Morello, but there is still more to tell. For the next three years, Salieri's crew was on top of the world, so to speak, or at least in theory. But a man with that much power can be willing to do whatever necessary to maintain that power, and Salieri is just such a man. So we get a new name on our hit list, prospective governor of a uh, Villanois, Hank Turnbull. Now, unlike Roberto Galati, Turnbull hasn't been mentioned until just now, but also unlike Galati, Turnbull himself isn't actually important, but rather serves to continue increasing the pressure and making Tommy second guess what he's doing, and why he's doing it. Since Tommy is by now both the guy that drives and the guy that shoots, he's tasked with personally assassinating Turnbull by getting access to a rundown part of an old prison opposite the venue where Turnbull is hosting an event, where we'll climb up to an old guard tower and snipe him. This mission is, well, it's definitely not one of my favorites, but at least this first half isn't too awful, it's just kind of boring. Once we reach the prison, we're supposed to follow these hobo signs to reach the guard tower, but even though I know the routine this time and didn't get lost, it still takes way longer than it needs to. Especially in a game where the only thing you're likely to find off the beaten path in an area like this is a collectible. Whoopee. I also get the feeling that this level reuses some geometry from Mafia 3, or Mafia 2 maybe, but I'm not actually sure. Presumably it would be from 3, since Mafia DE was built off the same framework shortly after the completion of 3, but this sewer section feels like it was ripped right out of the Mafia 2 level balls and beans. When I finally reach the guard tower, I find the sniper that was stashed and get to take exactly one shot with it before it gets taken away. After killing Turnbull, we gotta turn around and leave, but the old rickety-ass guard tower walkway collapses, and now we have to walk our way back through the empty prison we just walked through, only this time armed with nothing but whatever we find. Something new I realized during this playthrough is that the first time you come through here, there are a variety of homeless people who are worried about Tommy being here to evict them. And when the police arrive to come looking for Tommy afterwards, they actually get evicted. Nice going, Tommy. 
Every time I've done this mission in the past, it's ended up getting loud, but this time I actually managed to find a new path that I'd never taken before and stay quiet all the way up to the end of the first section, but after that, I don't think you have a choice about going loud since all the cops suddenly know where you are beyond this one door. This is actually one of my favorite fights in the game in this room. It isn't terribly complicated, but it's just a good set piece, and I always enjoy this one room specifically, but what comes next? Oh god, what comes next? So once we get outside, we are given a simple goal. In theory, escape the cops. But remember, we just killed a gubernatorial candidate, and the cops already know who we are. Outside the gate of the old prison are already three cop cars and a bunch of cops, all of whom aren't exactly inclined to just let us pass. Every single time I do this section, I hate it. I just hate it so much. I don't actually know what the game expects me to do on classic difficulty because the only strategy that seems to work is to hop into the first car, floor it, and pray that you don't get shot on the way out, which is sloppy and inconsistent to say the least. The first time I actually manage to lose the cops, I start driving normally and casually and accidentally almost hit this pedestrian. But in this game, when you're already wanted, that's a death sentence. Two minutes later, I'm being arrested again and, well... <laughs> Eventually, though, I managed to slip away just barely and lose the cops by parking until they actually stop searching for me, but once that's done, all that's left is driving back to Tommy's house. Yeah, this is actually the first time you get to see or go to Tommy's house in the game, which I guess implies that he only bought it after Salieri completely took over. It's also funny, because in the mission Visiting Rich People, Tommy says that the whole picket fence life isn't for him, and yet five years later, here he is. It's here that we learn the other purpose that Turnbull served in the story when we learn that he was fighting to pass the 19th Amendment and give people like Tommy's wife Sarah the right to vote. Oof. Big oof. This one is easily one of my least favorite in the game, up there with Fair Play and Happy Birthday, but luckily the next few are all pretty good, which is good since we are now in the final leg of the story. But it's time for a bit more free ride first, and this time I actually managed to finish the mission Betty, unlocking the red car, which I think is the same car that Vito and Joe drive at the end of the game, but... I'm not sure, and luckily the car does not guzzle gas the way it does in the mission when used outside of it. But with another free ride mission under my belt and much quicker than the last one I tried, I may have gotten a little cocky as I went to try another one, Electric Trick Track, over by the game's barely used dam. There is just so much unused map in this game. Anyway, so this mission is, like all the other missions in free ride on Classic, bullshit. Now, I realized probably too late that playing at night made it way harder, but trust me when I say that doing this during the day is still a gigantic pain in the ass. Which really sucks, because I really want this car. I got a bit too frustrated trying at night, though, and eventually decided I would try during the day, so... Uh, wait. How do I get back to Salieri's from here? Yeah, so in order to change the time and weather, you have to interact with this appropriate painting at Salieri's bar, since time doesn't pass normally during gameplay, like in something like Grand Theft Auto. Problem is, I drove out here, and when I started the mission, it deleted the car that I came here with and replaced it with the car for the mission. I can't use the car from the mission to get back, because failing the mission puts you back here, and if you look around in the middle of the night, there are no freaking cars around here! I actually spent like 10 minutes or something ridiculous trying to run back to civilization, but eventually got distracted by my cat, and while dealing with him, there was a power surge, deleting that recording, so just trust me, it happened, and it was absurd. But enough of that. Time to finally finish the story with the game's final three missions. And they're all pretty good. For the most part. The first is just for relaxation, which sees Salieri tasking Sam, Polly, and Tommy with getting their hands on a shipment of contraband cigars from the docks, which Tommy immediately identifies as suspicious. Well, he doesn't quite say that, but he does voice his concerns to the room, demonstrating that by this point he's confident enough that they'll be taken into account, which they are not. Tommy correctly sniffs out that the real score isn't the cigars, but actually a shipment of diamonds being smuggled inside the cigar boxes, which, while still very risky, presents a much greater reward. The first part of the mission sees us all drive over to the docks, but on the way, Polly starts to talk about pulling a bank heist due to his frustrations with not making enough money in his current position, still living alone in a small apartment around the corner from Salieri's bar. I didn't mention it at the time, but at the beginning of election campaign, Tommy adds a bit of extra money to his kickback when Polly is a bit short one week, leading to Salieri lecturing Tommy and foreshadowing this scene right here. Sam and Tommy both talk Polly out of the bank job, but Sam seems far more bothered by Polly bringing it up than Tommy does. Despite this, they still both agree to keep their mouths shut about it, so long as Polly either lets it go or brings it up to the dawn, as his intention was not to tell him about it or only tell him after pulling it off. When we finally get control again, we have to find a customs truck, which is just around the block, and then drive it to Sam and Polly, who have acquired two, yes, only two, uniforms, for sneaking inside. Then, for some reason, we are put into the back of the truck like in the mission A Trip to the Country, but there's no shooting at any point from this perspective, so I'm not sure why this was here. 
but eventually we are actually given control again when we pull up to the warehouse and have to sneak inside to find the cigar crates, and thus the diamonds. This is another mission that once you actually know where to go becomes a million times easier, because the first time around you're liable to be checking every box and sneaking around every inch of the facility. This time though, I knew exactly where I was going and who I could and could not engage with, but I did still kill these two guys because, eh, why not? Once you find the cigars, the door to exit is right there, which, while convenient, really makes me wonder why we didn't just use that door, but whatever, I guess we didn't know where they were. The final section of the mission sees us driving again to escape the cops, with Polly in the back, and capable of shooting to defend us. Now the tricky part here is that there are numerous roadblocks around the work quarters, and if you get spotted, you'll almost certainly get the truck destroyed, so I just drive around keeping an eye out for those big-ass exclamation marks, and turning around to find another path whenever I see them. I definitely remember getting really frustrated trying to find a way out of the works quarter without being spotted, but once again, thanks to experience, I actually didn't have too much trouble during this playthrough, and eventually make my way out to deliver the truck to Salieri's warehouse on the far east end of town. During the cutscene, though, it's revealed that actually, the real score wasn't the cigars or the diamonds, but it was in fact, heroin. A triple deception, and for reasons related to the Godfather movie, this is apparently a lot worse. So yeah, the Godfather kind of started this long-held tradition in Mafia media of there being at least one family who is completely opposed to the sale and distribution of drugs, which is complete and utter bullshit. The real-world mob never, and I mean never, had some kind of moral conundrum over the sale of narcotics. And also, newsflash, alcohol is also a drug. But because of the immense success of the Godfather movie, which arguably created the culture necessary for the creation of a game like Mafia, there is a false belief in this we don't sell that shit idea, including in this game and in every other game in this series. More importantly though, the real problem with the score being dope and not diamonds is that Salieri didn't tell them about it, and that by selling dope he would make a lot more money, which means Salieri is ripping everybody off. Big shocker. Once Tommy realizes this, he starts to come around to Polly's bank heist idea, and in the final section of the mission, we walk with him to the train station and get to learn more about Polly's situation. But the next morning, or, I don't know, maybe a day or two later or something, it's happening. You doing this? We're doing it. And we bust into the bank to, hey, I know this bank, I've, uh, robbed it before. I mean, all I stole was a clown's corpse, but, um... So this mission is actually kind of stupid simple, I realize, especially when compared to the absolute gauntlet that is pennies from hell in the same location. We bust in, scare everybody a bit, and then we retrieve the bank manager who leads us down to the vault. Now, Tommy tells the manager to make the guard downstairs stand down, but I'm pretty sure that actually never happens, and even if it does... Shoot him! I ain't got time for that, so it's a quick little battle down here, and then we gotta get the tiny little key for the massive fucking vault door from the manager. With money in hand, we get one more fight down here, but yet again, it's nothing compared to how much they throw at you during Pennies from Hell, and when everybody's dead, we can escape out the back just like in that mission, and jump in a very convenient car to make our getaway. Seriously, if that car hadn't been there, heist over. Then it's just a matter of losing the cops, which in this game can be very easy, or more often than not, very annoying. Once we shake them, though, we drive over to, uh, the Palermo Club? Which is apparently a club that Sam owns, I guess, even though it's never been mentioned until now. Again, I assume that he got this after taking over Morello's territory, especially given it's on what used to be his turf, but this feels like a missed opportunity. Like, we should have gotten at least one scene showing Lady Killer Sam and his club, but as it stands, we only ever get to see the outside and the garage. But now it's time. Time for the finale, the death of Art. In the morning, after the heist, when Tommy is meant to go see Polly and split up the take, he's stopped by Sarah, who notices that he's on edge. Tommy talks about getting out of town for a while, and that Polly and him had just recently come into a bunch of money, and Sarah is immediately suspicious. When we leave, we also get our first chance to actually drive Tommy's car, which is odd. Odd that it took this long, anyway. On the drive over to Polly's, we hear on the radio a news report about the robbery, which says that they have no solid leads yet, which is good. But when we get over to Polly's, the door is already open, and... Oh, that's bad. Ah, Jesus. Polly. Polly.
Oh, yeah. Sam, it's me. It's Tom. Where's Polly? He's, uh... He's dead. I'm looking at him, slumped over in a hallway, torn a fucking skull. Oh, God. I was... I was calling to warn him. About what? Jesus Christ. I owe you fellas my life three times over. Warn him about what, Sam? Salieri. He found out about the bank job. You're in deep shit, Tom. You gotta disappear. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I just need some cash to get me and the girls out of town. Can you swing that? Sure. Anything, pal. Uh, you want me to come to Polly's? No. No, I can't stay here. Uh, meet me at the, the city gallery. Yeah, okay. Keep your head down, Tom. I'll uh, see you soon. And, uh... Thanks, Sam. I always pay my debts, son. You know that. Bowie. Now, some of you may already know what's coming, but next we drive over to the museum to meet Sam and, well... Move, Tommy. Shit. Hey, Tom. Sam. What the hell's going on? You and Polly. You put me in a bad spot. I know, Sam, but I'm sorry about that, but I need to get out of town. Can you help me or not? There you go again. Making me choose between my friends and the family. This is what you were looking for, Polly's. Here's your cut. It's more than you deserve. Sam. You killed him. You killed Polly. No. Polly got himself killed. And you seem real tore off about it. I'm just in a good mood. Things are right between me and the Don. I'm moving up, and I just found this big bag of money. The Don knows about Frank, Tom. The whore, too. That whore? The girl you were sweet on? You're the one that let her live. Sorry about this, Tom. But our business has rules. Shame, too. Don Salieri really liked you. Guess we'll both have a good cry at your funeral. You think you're doing this because you're loyal, but you're not. You're just scared. Maybe. But you would have lived a lot longer if you would have just looked over your shoulder from time to time. Goodbye. Don't let him suffer, boys. He's my buddy. Now looking back, playing through the game multiple times, this is very much a twist done correctly. In fact, the first time I played it, I probably looked a lot like Tommy does in that scene, just flabbergasted at the outcome, but ultimately seeing that this was inevitable given who Sam was. Now normally, once you start the actual shootout, the game's soundtrack blares throughout as it does during any action scene, but I had started experimenting with turning the music off during the freeride missions since it was putting me on edge. And I also turned it off for this final fight too, and honestly it makes it so much better. So much more atmospheric and lets the dread of the final encounter with Sam build a lot more naturally. Where'd you go, Sam? B! 
Business is business, Tom. I know that you, out of all of them, know that. This final fight is actually really good. It's hard, I mean, everything is on classic difficulty, but there is plenty of cover and it never feels overly cheap like some other fights in the series towards the end of the game that I could mention. I got tantalizingly close to finishing this mission in one clean run, which is always the most satisfying for this game, but I unfortunately did die a couple times towards the end. This whole mission is great though, or at least I always have a lot of fun doing it, and I think it's one of the better examples of this kind of mission, the final fight against the boss and his goons, done correctly. Maybe some people were hoping we get to personally take down Salieri, but this is far more personal since Sam was Tommy's good friend, supposedly. And the final scene really hits home just how much Sam's betrayal broke him. <laughs> we sure had some laughs, right? Remember that time? Me, you, and Polly. <laughs> Then we get the epilogue, where we finally catch up to the intermezzo scenes from earlier, presumably taking place shortly after Tommy goes into hiding from killing Sam. Tommy and Detective Norman finally reach an agreement, Salieri for his family's safety, and then we get a short montage of what happens to Tommy's life over the next 13 years. Tommy gives the names of everybody he worked for with the Salieri family, and we see the Don, Vinny, and even Ralphie all arrested while Tommy himself spends eight years in prison for his own crimes, before finally being released. Gets us out of bed in the morning. Well, lets us chase our dreams, even when they're moving too fast to catch. That keeps us from falling over. When we're too tired to take another step. Mr. Angelo. Yes. Mr. Salieri sends his regards. Tommy! That's okay. You're safe now. You're all safe. Remember that money, jobs, and with that, we get a look at the, frankly, pretty ugly models of Vito and Joe in the Mafia DE engine, and then Tommy dies on his front lawn. I also find it funny that only Sarah says anything about her husband dying and not his daughter or son-in-law or whoever that fourth person is. I mean, it's obviously because they didn't bother to get voice actors for the daughter, which is also why she's never seen or heard in cutscenes until now, but still, amusing. And that's Mafia Definitive Edition. I considered, very briefly, completing all the free ride missions, but then I asked myself, why would I do that to myself? So, what are my thoughts overall? Well, like I said, I didn't grow up with Mafia. I wish I had, but I'm honestly kind of glad I got to experience the franchise starting with this version first, rather than the original, because at least from my very biased perspective, this is a much better experience overall than the 2002 classic version. Now, I'm not saying there is no merit to the original, but this is effectively a whole new game made from the bones of that original version. And beyond the technical problems, which seem to be mostly related to 2K's horrible launcher, it plays a lot better overall than the original does, at least on modern PCs. Now, maybe I would enjoy the original if I had controls that weren't complete ass, which would mean emulating it or buying the original hardware, but I'm not entirely convinced I actually want to, after having played the first few chapters. If you really want me to do a game vault on Mafia Classics, sign up to my Patreon. I'll make it a patron goal, even if they don't officially do those things anymore. If I can get to 100 paid patrons by the end of November, I'll make it happen. Anyways, Mafia Definitive Edition overall is a really fun experience, and one that I imagine is even more fun when you don't torture yourself by playing on classic difficulty. While I myself usually like to play games on the hardest difficulty setting, I don't always feel the need to, and more importantly, I don't think everybody should feel the need to either, and have absolutely no problem with difficulty settings for accessibility. I recommend you play the game on hard if you're like me and more of a casual game player these days and less of a gamer TM, but even if you do play on classic, it's still a lot of fun most of the time, and when it gets bad, it makes up for it with an incredibly engaging story, characters, and world. My biggest gripe with Mafia Definitive Edition is that it didn't go far enough with changing the formula of the original. 
I honestly think this game would be a lot better with a simple change of being able to load into Free Ride by default, like in a Grand Theft Auto game, and then being allowed to start each chapter from Salieri's bar or whatever. That, combined with more things to do in general in the city, would make this game one of my all-time favorites, but as it stands, there is just so much missed opportunity. The City of Lost Heaven is gorgeous, the atmosphere is perfect, and there are just so many locations that go completely unseen or unused in this frankly huge world map for a game originally made in 2002. I don't know how much they rescaled things, but from what I can tell, it wasn't much. I can understand why this wasn't done, though, to an extent, as transforming this from a surface-level 1930s sim to something more detailed like the world of Grand Theft Auto V would have been a massive workload for a company as comparably small as Hangar 13. As it stands, Mafia's world looks great at first glance, and the textures, lighting, and sound design all help to sell this image, but when you look a little closer, it starts to fall apart fast. It's kind of like a backdrop for one of those classic Roadrunner skits. It looks great and real enough to actually engage with, but once you do, pedestrians start acting really awkward, lines of dialogue get repeated ad nauseum, and cars start to honk at you waiting at a red light. I guess I just wish there had been more time or a bigger team put on this, because what we could have had based on what we actually got just leaves me wanting so much more. The story, though, is absolutely fantastic. My understanding is that there are a number of changes to the original script. The dialogue seems almost completely rewritten, and certain plot points have been changed. But in the remake, the acting is just phenomenal and goes a long way in making you believe these characters and the world they live in. Honestly, the entire main cast is incredible, with Don DiPietà as Sam, Jeremy Luke as Polly, Bella Pop as Sarah, Glenn Taranto as Don Salieri, and Andrew Bongiorno as the guy that drives, Tommy Angelo, and a bunch of others. While the game's story is fantastic, though, it often feels like it just wants to be a movie rather than a game, which is a trend that extends far beyond the Mafia franchise and has become more prevalent across the entire industry. It doesn't quite fall into that dreaded walking simulator territory too often, but it also doesn't lean into the fact that it's a game either, which makes it hard for me to truly love it as a game. As a story, I adore it. It's among my favorite video game stories, in fact, I think I've ever experienced, but it could have been just as good as a movie since at no point did my actions as the player actually play a role in affecting the story, but... That's just what I want out of it. The shooting in the game is clunky and pretty annoying most of the time, too. Crosshairs suck and are often way too big, and aiming with a controller is awful, but I can't blame the game as much for that as my awful dying PS4 controller, and the fact that I just didn't want to play with a mouse and keyboard, when I probably should have done that for on-foot sections like that, and just switched to a controller when having to drive. Especially since Mafia is one of those few games that actually doesn't mind actively switching between the two on the fly. Now, having played Mafia 3 since I first played DE also probably helped a lot, since I noticed a lot more assets being reused and models and animations being recycled, which isn't a bad thing by any means, but it helped to contextualize the game a lot more for me. I have since played all three mainline entries into the series, and I will be doing a game vault on all three, as well as a criminal history on Lincoln Clay, don't you worry. And I think that overall, DE is probably my second favorite in terms of gameplay, and my second favorite in terms of story overall. It's one of the best stories I've experienced in a game in a very long time. I can't exactly say the same about all of this gameplay, though. Don't get me wrong, it is still plenty fun to play, but especially when seeing the effort that went into fleshing out Mafia 3's world in comparison to this one, my overall feeling with this game is that I just want it to be slightly more than what it is. Alright, it's trophy time. First up, we have the Wise Guy Trophy. This is for me one of, if not the best, mobster-type game set in the 1930s, with very little contest, though. To be fair, it's not exactly a super extensive category. Along with games like the original Godfather game, this stands as my go-to if I want to vicariously live through the eyes of a 1930s gangster, and I think it also perfectly captures the Godfather, Scarface, Goodfellas vibe in its acting, atmosphere, and direction, and blends them together to make a truly excellent experience for any fans of any mafioso media. Next, we got the Definitive Edition trophy. Ever since the release of the dreaded GTA Definitive Editions, that term has become almost a joke in the wider gaming community. But Mafia DE, at least when you bypass 2K's horrible launcher, is a much more respectable take on what a Definitive Edition should be. It remakes an otherwise clunky and primitive game from a bygone era and revives it for a modern audience, while not only retaining what made the original great, but also expanding upon it and improving on it at almost every turn. Now, I'm sure fans of the classic will object to some of this, but this is just my take. Mafia DE is infinitely better than the original, at least it is now, since it did seem to have, like so many games do, a lot more issues at launch, and I am definitely not excusing that crap. Finally, we have the Three Amigos trophy. Yeah, again. Now, the relationship between Sam, Polly, and Tommy is very different than the one between Michael, Franklin, and Trevor, but these three honestly have such good chemistry together that it gives GTA a run for its money. I really wish we'd gotten to see more of Polly's backstory or Sam at his club, because when these three are together, they bounce off each other so perfectly, and I enjoy them every time they're on screen together. And that's about it. 
thanks for tuning in once again, y'all. Like I said, I do plan to do a game vault on Mafia 2 and 3, but not necessarily on Mafia 1 Classic. So if you really want that, sign up to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker. That's Guinness with one N. Link in the description. If I get 100 paid patrons by the end of November, I will make a Mafia 1 Classic episode. But that's going to do it for this video. If you've made it this far and enjoy my content, consider watching the Game Vault episodes on games besides GTA or Mafia. I did one on Mario 64 and Zelda Ocarina of Time, but, well, the views aren't exactly proportional to, say, my GTA 5 episode. Anyway, I've been Guinness Walker, the criminal historian, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.